Welcome back. In this video, what I'm going to do is give some simple examples thinking about how we can take Bayes' theorem and apply it to real data. I'm going to start uh, by thinking about a simple case, uh, kind of a, a medical false positives rate case, where I'm going to think about the components of Bayes' theorem in terms of specific probabilities, so specific individual numbers. So let's start by thinking about some of the statistics that we often get when we think about running tests. And this is going to, again, be couched in a medical example, but uh, it can be applied to any other kind of sensor. And you know these sorts of medical tests are ones that affect all of us every day, uh, particularly you know, at the time that I'm recording this, um, I'm getting tested for COVID every week. So we think about what we would want to know about this. So if a patient has a disease, the test returns a positive 99% of the time. So the probability of getting a positive given that you disease you know, for a particular test, let's say that's 99%. And that, you know, seems like a pretty high efficacy. So that's, that's a useful thing to know about a test. How often does it return a positive when you have the disease? The other thing that's important to know about a test is the rate of false positives. So what's the, if a patient does not have the disease, the test returns positive 5% of the time. So if it's a, this particular test that we're talking about has a 5% rate of false positives, which seems uh, you know, non-trivial, but 5%, that seems pretty low. So it might not be a big deal. And let's imagine that we're running a test where uh, one in a thousand people has this disease. So it's a 0.1 probability that you have a disease if I just pick someone at random. So we have a test with a high uh, efficacy, a relatively low rate of false positives, a decently high prevalence in the population. You know, one in a thousand is a pretty high pr prevalence. And so we can then ask, what's the probability that someone who tested positive has this disease? What's the probability that you have a disease given that you're positive? And so we wanna be able to get from the probability that you're positive given the disease, probability of disease given that you're positive. So to get from one to the other, we need to use Bayes' theorem. So we can write that out, the probability of that you have the disease given that you tested positive is the probability that you're positive, of testing positive given that you have the disease times the probability that you have the disease. Again, that's just coming from Bayes' theorem. And then in the uh, denominator, we have that sum or integral where we, in this case, since it's discrete, we're just going to sum over the possible cases. So we have what we had before, the probability that you're positive given that you have the disease, the probability that you have the disease. And we also have the other case, the probability that you're positive given that you don't have the disease and the probability that you don't have the disease. So in this case, uh, we have discrete actual numbers that we can plug in for these probabilities. So we can say the probability that you're positive given that you disease, that's your 99% efficacy. You have the probability that you're getting the disease, that's that one in a thousand. That number goes down in here as well. And then for this other term, we have the probability that you're positive given that you don't have the disease, that's our rate of false positives, that was 5%. And the probability that you don't have a disease, well, that's just one minus the probability that you do, so that's 999 out of a thousand. We do a little bit of arithmetic uh, and we get in total that if you test, the probability that you have this disease, given that you tested positive is only about 2%, even though the test was 99% effective. And in that case, it's because in this case, the rate of false positives, 5% uh, was actually quite high relative to the background rate um, one in a thousand. You know, so for a test like this, uh, so if, if this was the test you had, um, what you would not want to do is be testing the general population because the general population is unlikely to have this disease, and which is actually why for a lot of um, medical diagnostics, they only run the tests on people if they have some 
higher probability of thinking that you have a disease. So, you know, if, if someone you know has been exposed for something infectious or if, uh, you know, for genetic diseases, if you have, you know, uh, predisposing conditions or, you know, some history of a disease in the family. So if you have something that would make you think that you have a higher rate of positivity, uh, then that, you know, is particularly important when you have tests that have this high rate of false positives is to uh, come in with a higher probability. Cool. Um, not to say that you shouldn't test people for for uh, diseases like COVID. In, this, in that case, you know, it's clear that, that the rate of false positives is quite low in that particular test such that we're, we're not mostly seeing false negatives. Okay, and, and this same sort of logic uh, can be applied to one of my favorite Bayesian comics, uh, which says, did the sun just explode? It's night, so we're not sure. And this says, a neutrino detector measures whether the sun has gone to Nova, then it rolls two dice. If they both come up sixes, it lies to us. Otherwise it tells us the truth. So we try the detector, has the sun go Nova? It gives a yes. Pointing out the frequentist would say the probability of this result happening by chance is one in 36. That's the odds of getting uh, you know, two sixes and that one in 36 is less than 0.05. So we could conclude the sun has exploded. Bayesian here just says, I bet you it hasn't. Uh, reflecting the fact that, uh, we, you know, similar to the, the last, assist, last example, uh, the Bayesian is taking into account the, the, his prior probability that the, that the sun has just exploded and that presumably is pretty low, you know. Um, so if that is low, you know, this, the inference from the data alone uh, is not sufficient. Now, this all is fun uh, and useful, but the powerful part about Bayes' theorem is not that it can be applied to these discrete probabilities, but it can also be applied to distributions and models. So imagine we have our classic linear regression. We have some X data, we have some Y. We're interested in the relationship between X and Y. Bayes' theorem says we can write down the probability of the slope and the intercept beta in our standard deviation sigma given our x and y data. So we can derive the probability distributions for our model's parameters given our data. And that's going to be equal to our likelihood. And this likelihood here, this normal for the y given x beta and sigma is just our standard linear regression likelihood. You know, so the X beta is just the matrix form of writing out you know, beta zero plus beta one X. Uh, and so that's the same likelihood we worked with when we derived uh, the maximum likelihood estimate for linear regression. It's the same likelihood that's embedded in all of the things we did in LM. But now if we wanna get the probability of beta and sigma, what we need to do is take that same likelihood and multiply it by our prior probabilities. So before we observe this data X and Y, what, were, what it was our prior understanding of the, the variability in that relationship and what the likely values of the slope and intercept were. Where those come from can actually be a little complicated. Um, in practice, uh, these are often set to fairly broad, what's called uninformative distributions. Uh, but in, in some important cases, you might have information from previous studies or meta-analyses or expert opinion to help constrain what these probabilities are. But given those priors and our ability to integrate things out in the denominator, uh, before anyone panics, I'll say you, we're never actually gonna do that integral. We're gonna use numerical methods, same as we do for maximum likelihood. Uh, different methods, but the same idea. And the point is you can get out these probability distributions. So given this likelihood and the priors, I can get back a probability distribution for my intercept, a probability distribution for my slope, a probability distribution for my standard deviation. And I got those things uh, without the need to make any additional assumptions and without the need to do additional analyses. So I, you know, I don't just get a best estimate of these things, then then I have to bootstrap. I don't have to bootstrap. I get uh, 
when I work with Bayes' theorem uh, and talk about the probabilities of model parameters, I get back their distributions. And that can allow me to directly ask questions like, what's the probability this slope is bigger than zero or construct an interval estimate around this slope? Um, it's direct and it's, it's then what we think it, we always thought it was. Um, we can also sample from these posteriors and propagate that uncertainties if we wanna you know, make a, an interval estimate. And that happens the exact same way we did in, in the Monte Carlo uncertainty propagation uh, previously. And you know, while I won't go into it here, it also turns out the numerical methods that most Bayesians use uh, are also more robust than the ones that we use in maximum likelihood. So maximum likelihood that uh, when we use numerical optimization, we saw that there was this, this uh, risk of getting stuck in, in local minima. And the numerical methods that Bayesian use tend to be much less sensitive to those local minima. So we tend to get not just distributions, but we tend to actually have more robust estimators. So to kind of wrap things up, uh, Bayesian pro and cons, you know, this now allows us to get us kind of what we really want in statistics, the probability, if we're fitting models to data, we wanna know the probability of those models given the data. Uh, it gives us in a way that, that it's logically complete and internally consistent without needing to make additional assumptions. Uh, it allows us to do inference that's not in a vacuum. So it allows us to use prior information. As mentioned earlier, it's inherently iterative and updatable. I can use the posteriors from one analysis as my next priors. And there's the but here. There's, there's very few uh, Bayesian models that have analytically analytical solutions. Um, and the numerical methods that we use, uh, most commonly known as MCMC, Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo being the same sort of Monte Carlo that we've been talking about in things like bootstrapping and uncertainty propagation, uh, is, is a bit more computationally demanding. Uh, that said, you know, it, it's, it, it's not always a given that it ends up truly being more demanding than doing optimization within a loop over a bootstrap, which is also computationally demanding. So that kind of wraps it up and that's gonna kind of wrap up the whole course. So just to kind of sum, you know, over the course of the semester, we, we started by talking about data and analyzing and visualizing it. We then brought in models and talked about how to fit models and data. Those models started simple, got progressively more complex, moved on to process space models. And now we're wrapping up, coming back and, and just giving a brief introduction to uh, Bayes' theorem, and uh, which is going to be the basis for uh, often, you know, more complex statistical models. Uh, has a, a lot of pros and cons. Well, a lot of pros. Um, so thank you, and hope you've enjoyed it.